Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Empowered Living Podcast by Empowered Life Church. We hope it blesses you. So last week I shared on the whiteboard a paradigm, a paradigm shift for prayer. And so you can go back and listen to the podcast or find it on YouTube or wherever. But I want to just kind of lead us into this place of prayer and intercession. So just a few scriptures. So I have here third heaven. So if you're thinking, oh no, what kind of church is this? In Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, it says God created the heavens and the earth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 2, the apostle Paul says, I knew a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. But he was caught up into the third heaven, which is the paradise of God. So there's not seven heavens, right? There's a show. There's three heavens and this third heaven. So the reason why I placed this here, because I wanted us to shift the paradigm from us standing here pleading and petitioning to God. Biblically, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, you can write this down and go back and study it. We are co-seated with him. That is a mindset shift. If, you, if you've never just meditated on the scripture teaching that we're seated with him in heavenly places, that will transform everything. If you're standing at the bottom of a mountain, you can just look all around us. We have beautiful mountains. And you look up, that's the mountain of impossibility. How am I ever going to climb to the top of the mountain? If I'm standing at the top of the mountain, I'm looking down. Everything looks easy. It's beautiful. It's a perspective shift. So how we pray needs to shift, all right? So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 says we're co-laborers with God. So Erica said that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father, and the Bible says he ever longs to make intercession for us. How does Jesus make intercession? Now, if you haven't been taught this before, this might challenge you. Jesus isn't up there going, God, I just pray right now for Ivan that he won't mess it up. He won't say the wrong thing, Lord, again, you know. That's not what it means. Jesus made an act of intercession. Paga means to stand in the gap. What in the world? She's excited and she blew a whistle. I normally don't get startled, but that startled me. I thought it was a fire alarm. I'm like, I don't even think it sounds like that. So the word paga means to stand in the gap. So the word intercessor is an advocate. It could also be looked at as an attorney. So Jesus made intercession, how? By shedding his blood on the cross. I want to share something with you. So on Wednesdays, we have the glory night where we just gather together with no agenda, but just to be in the presence of the Lord. So you go, what does that mean? Exactly. You just come and worship Jesus for two hours. And we don't have to perform. I don't have a message prepared. We're not trying to get people... It's just come and learn how to go deep in worship and prayer. That's one of my favorite things that we do. And I'm standing in the back, and I have these thoughts filling my heart. And I'm just going to be honest with you and reflect how I was experiencing it. The thought that comes in my heart is, I'm the alpha. I'm the omega. I'm the first. I'm the last. I'm the beginning, and I'm the end. I'm not hearing it like I'm telling you, but these thoughts are flooding. I, I know that's in Revelation, So I open to Revelation, I read the text, I'm just not getting anything. I'm like, what does this mean? Am I supposed, and I keep hearing it over and over, so I begin to meditate on it. Then I feel like these thoughts keep flooding my heart, and I hear this, Ivan, I'm the beginning, I start at this. I'm the end, I'll finish it. And I'm the one in the middle that's culminating all things into myself, which that is a scripture. And so I'm like, thanks for the reminder, (laughs) Are you, you ever talk to the Lord and you're like, I'm not trying to be rude, I just don't get it. What, am I, what does this mean? Because I feel like, do I not know this? And then I hear, I'm waging war over your promises. So I said, I need a Bible verse for that. Because he sat down at the right hand of the Father. All Old Testament where he's called the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, New Covenant, he's defeated his enemies. We looked at those verses last week. So I said, I need a verse because that sounds like I'm just in my imagination right now. And then I hear, the blood still speaks. Whoo, guess what? The blood of Jesus was an act of spiritual warfare. Not only was the veil torn from top to bottom when Jesus said it is finished, means that we can all come boldly before the presence of the Lord, not just the high priest. 
It also says principalities and powers were disarmed. And in Hebrews it says the enemy was defeated. So the blood of Jesus still speaks means what? Forgiveness is still happening today. Healing is still happening, happening today. Deliverance is still happening today. And so I thought, okay. And I couldn't get this phrase out of my heart. So I came up here. I grabbed the mic sheepishly because I'm like, and I just said what I just said to you without all the explanation. Then I went and sat down and I went, mm. Erica prays before creating the playlist. And as you can tell, she's very spiritual and she, it all has a purpose and a flow and a why. Why well, I wasn't paying attention to the flow. So after I share the word, the song starts to kick in like, like we timed it. And I'm like, okay, well, that's cool at least. <laughs> Margaret, what's your friend's name? So Margaret brought her friend Iris and Leah led the service and she was doing testimony time. And Iris says, I've, I've been in pain for years. Well, she had surgery in November. She had surgery in November. So she's your friend. Yeah, she had a she, hip replacement in November and it went bad. It just, she'd been constant fevers, constant pain, using a walker weeks after she should have not. And was supposed to return to work January 1st and just came back last Friday. So she's been very ill, very ill. So what happened? <laughs> she was healed. Um, Wednesday night, it, she said it's been broke off, that she's been very depressed, thought this was the end of her life. Um, <laughs> And she came to work Friday, and I watched her get out of her car and head up, shoulders up, and almost bounced into the building. And she said she was afraid to wake up Thursday because she was afraid it would all be back, but it's not. Come on. And smiles and telling everyone that Jesus has delivered her once again and that he's not done with her yet. So. So that happened on Wednesday, and so I wanted to wait. Hopefully you thought she'd come back, but I guess she lives far away. So I asked Margaret. Margaret's a nurse. Some of you might know. So she followed up with her. She's still healed. So the blood of Jesus still speaks. So when Jesus ever lives to make intercession, he's not up there pacing back and forth, right? It is the blood of Jesus that made intercession for you, and it's still speaking. It's profound. Think about it. So I want us to understand what does it mean to co-labor with God? Co-labor? Well, it's all finished, right? It's all finished, but you're not finished. <laughs> your story is unfolding, right? Your calling, your, your purpose. And, and I want to just align something here very quickly. When you learn to pray from heavenly places, when you, you are co-laboring with God. There's this saying that's challenging when you first hear it. God has chosen to handcuff himself to the prayers of the saints. Think about it. You said, give me a Bible verse. I'm glad you asked. It says you have not because you ask not. That means there's things, there's lack in your life right now because you haven't asked. Whew. It's, it's profound. So understanding the importance of prayer, it is a privilege. It is a high honor for every king and every priest, which, we're, which we are. Learning to pray from heavenly places. So this is the phrase that was in my heart this whole week. Think like Jesus, pray like Jesus. So, you know, WWJD, what would Jesus do? How many of you know you should know what he's doing? The thing that I keep pushing, and I know it's challenging to some people because I watch their faces, not you, but I evangelize in the sauna. <laughs> Two guys uh, yesterday, I just was talking about Jesus. What church do you go to? It's just so hot in there. You just don't have time for small talk. I just, I just ask him politics. We just go for it. It's just like the best conversations. And um, I was telling them, people in the West America, we think that church is just only fellowship and Bible study. Think about it. That's what we think it is, fellowship and Bible study. So we need more fellowship. We need more Bible study. Keep the coffee hot. Add tea for the people that don't drink coffee. Let's hang out. What am I missing? Stop and think. What am I missing? This is the house of God. <laughs> this is the place of his presence. He's enthroned by our praises. He's alive. He's not just stuck in a book. So when we gather together, we gather, we host the presence of the Lord. 
Worship is the most effective form of prayer. Did you hear what I said, right? Worship is the most effective form of prayer. It's just to gather in the presence of the Lord and just tell Him He's good and tell Him He's great and honor Him. And in that place, what begins to take place is an alignment where we begin to think like Jesus. And sometimes we need to worship a little longer because we're just not there yet. Amen? That's why the song selection is critical. All these things are very important because if we're singing, I'm a worm, I'm a sinner, I'm, God hates me, and I... That's a very Calvinist worship song I just made up. <laughs> Sorry. That affects how you believe. So today, Rob created a song list that had us in the throne room the whole time. It was beautiful. It's important, okay? So watch. I'm going to read. We're going to do some Bible study together today. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. I want to look at it together. We're going to look at three verses together. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I'm reading out of the NASB. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Let's break some of these things down. First thing that I want you to see is present your bodies. It's not just your physical body. It's not just your outer. It's your being. Spirit, soul, and body. Present all of yourself to God. This is what? Romans 12.1 says that worship is to present your entire being to God. So you say, well, what did we just do? We praised Him. Praise is, there's seven Hebrew words. I have a book that I wrote called The Identity Manual. I have seven Hebrew words for praise. Every single word for praise is an action. If you go, I'm praising God right now. Not biblically. Biblically, toda, barak, uh, hala, all of them, all the words are expressing something to God. All right? So what we did was praise the Lord. But it's hard to praise God and understand the importance of praise if you don't have a lifestyle of worship. Let's, let's pause and, and reflect on this for a minute. This week, I got this crud that just doesn't want to leave. I'm, I feel better. I'm not sick anymore. I can't get out of bed. And it's, it's been hitting me this wave of sickness, right? So all week, I'm waking up and I'm focusing on gratitude. God, I appreciate you. You're the healer. Because what happens when you feel sick? You feel sick. <laughs> you start telling yourself things. You start feeling down, right? So gratitude, appreciation. I'm, I'm praising God. I'm wrestling through it. I'm taking my vitamins. I'm going to the sauna. I still have work to do, right? We don't have time for sickness, do we? <laughs> right? So we're just contending. And then all of a sudden, I come here, and after my week, I just, I want to thank him. I want to worship him. I want to praise him because this entire week I put him first. I've had to sacrifice my energy, my strength, my body, and the whole time my lifestyle is yes to you, Lord. Father, I'm going to meet with somebody. I'm exhausted. I'm distracted. I ask for your thoughts, God. My life is yes to him. When you live a life of yes to Jesus, it's easy to praise. It's hard to praise God when we're ah, you know, I'm so mad at God and he hasn't done this for me and he doesn't exist and how come he didn't heal me and my back is aching and my feet. And, and then you come in here and we're singing, how great thou art. And you're like, meh. It's true. So the depth of your lifestyle, which is worship, will equal your praise. All right? That's why Erica's like, let's keep going. Let's go deeper. And others are like, when's the Bible study coming? Because that's really what church is. I came for the Bible study. You missed the whole point. Jesus is in the room. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, right? So we understand this. And this is really, really important in changing the way that you think. Because that means that Sunday morning worship is not just, I worship God on Sunday. Every time you say yes to Jesus and no to the enemy, yes to Jesus and no to the flesh, you are worshiping him. All right? So I beseech you now, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. This is your reasonable act of worship. And then he goes on to say, be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. 
that you might prove what is the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. So guess what? You want to know what the will of God is? You have to change the way you think. I want to tell you a little bit about the will of God. From my personal journey, performance is not always a bad thing, right? Um, Catalina and Dane, they had a dance performance. I love dance, frankly. I, there was a window that I was, thought I was going to be a, a classical. I don't know. I just love it. I think dance is beautiful to me. And so I, I watched the videos. I, I love it. I was the first one to like it, you know. So there's, there's not, that was the first. There's nothing wrong with, with performance. There is something wrong with performing for God's approval. So my whole kind of upbringing, not my parents' fault, but I, I studied martial arts and I was competitive. So I competed in tournaments probably every Saturday. So I'm, I'm winning. And if I lose, then I'm upset. So it kind of created this framework in me. Everything I do, I have to win. So my measurables are what? Bigger's better. You know the, you know the sacrifice, is that the right word? To, for me to pastor a small church, how that humbles me. <laughs> you guys humble me by not showing up. I'm like, God, I know I can preach. I know I'm a good teacher. I, how come nobody wants to hear me speak? You know, it is that. It's, it's, it's ego. Let's just admit it. It's ego, but it's there, man. Right? <laughs> And most pastors struggle with that. And so for me, I kind of treated God like I wanted to get something from him all the time. So it was formulaic. If I pray more, will I get more anointing? And if I fast more, will I get more healing power? Will I... And it was this kind of thing. And so then it becomes the will of God must look like I'm going to be famous. I'm going to transform the world. I'm going to give a message like Billy Graham in front of... Right. And so a lot of us struggle with that. It's called destination's disease. When your mind is renewed, you understand it's not about being a human doing, it's about being a human being. So the will of God looks like me revealing Jesus everywhere I go. It looks like me loving my wife like Christ loved the church. Me loving my children. It looks like me loving you. I'm going to share more about this in a moment in the next verse, but... It looks like no greater love is this, that you lay your life down for one another. What? How would you lay your life, maybe for your spouse or for your kids, but for a stranger, would you lay your life down? That requires the renewal of the mind. Now, if we're all here trying to be famous, you know, let's, let's preach and let's be the worship team that's traveling all over the world. And how many of you know, I have preached in front of thousands. I have preached on platforms. Guess what? You get down and you're still you. <laughs> Destination's disease. Like if you're going to arrive at something. So let, this requires a renewal of the mind. It is about me becoming love. And yeah, I get to do some stuff, right? I have young teenage sons and the conversation about what's the will of God and, and, and what am I going to be when I grow up? How many of you know you're going to be a lot of things? <laughs> you change about every seven years. If you've heard something about me from seven years ago, I'm not that person anymore. Yeah. Did you know that we actually shed skin? Yeah. I'm not the same person I used to be. You're not the same person you used to be. I have to see you as a new creation in Christ. That means I've got to change the way I think. I can't hold you to what somebody said about you. Yeah. I can't hold God to what I think he should do. I have to learn to continually renew my mind. How? How do we renew your mind? And this word mind, again, I want you to not be so Greek in thinking like, oh, you mean your brain. It's your being again. You know you have in your heart sensors. You know in your stomach, you know, some of you, the Tamras that sell the gut bio products, you know, <laughs> whatever, plexus. They're like, you have feelings in your stomach. You do. They call your stomach another brain. Right? So we're talking about renewed in every part of your being. So true renewal doesn't just mean that you sing longer in church, and you tithe more in church, and you pray more in church. It transforms every part of you. All right. I think I overdid that one. Okay. Let's look at transform. The word for transform is metamorpho. 
It's where we get our English word metamorphosis. It's the ca uh, you know, the cocoon that I was thinking of, the chrysalis and all the phases, but who cares? It's the cocoon to the butterfly. It's transformation. Where else do we see that word metam uh, metamorpho? We see it in Mark chapter 9 and Matthew chapter 17. Am I boring you guys? You bored? Okay. Mark 9, Matthew 17. Not that I would do anything different. I mean, <laughs> it's the story of Jesus being transfigured. Remember? They're, they're praying and they see Jesus, the voice of the Father says, This is my son. And then the Bible says he's transfigured. That word there is metamorpho, it's the same word. So, what does it mean to be transformed? It is the unveiling of Christ in you. It is the glory of God that you carry on the inside of you being revealed. Right? It's beautiful. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We carry the presence of the Lord. Transformation is an inside job. It's beautiful. I, I, I just find it to be fantastic. So how do we renew the mind? Yes, I encourage you to read the Bible. I encourage you to read the Bible in context because the scripture when it's God-breathed, has power to transform the mind. Scripture also has power to create wars. Did you hear what I said? So we need to read the Word by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Not to get a different interpretation, but I, I, I'm just at the place in my life where I don't want to debate people about the Bible anymore. I just feel like it's a waste of time. Oh, well, apologetics, you go and do that ministry. I want to love people right where they're at, prophesy, word of knowledge, read their mail, heal their body in Jesus' name. Then they go, who? And I go, you figure that one out, how that just happened. Right? Instead of debating and arguing. But just studying the Bible can actually make you a Pharisee. I know a lot of people that quote the scriptures and they're mean. So it's not just read the Bible. Yes, that's a part of it. But it's allowing the word of God to transform you. It's asking the Holy Spirit to breathe upon those words. But the key today, the key of my whole message today, is going to be Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about Him. So let's move to another passage of Scripture. Let's look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. So I'm going to, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. I'm going to write it here on the board. 1 Corinthians Chapter 2 and verse 16. I didn't do a good job erasing it. That's going to drive some of you crazy. <sighs> That's why I'm going to leave it there. All right. 1 Corinthians. Let me just find it here in my, my Bible app. Let's read it together. Again, I'm reading it in the NSB. The whole passage is like one of my favorites, okay? But did I just give you the wrong verse? Two, there is no verse 16. Oh, there it is. Let's jump up to verse, I don't know, 6. The whole, the whole thing. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age or of the rulers of this age who are passing away. Verse 7. We speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they understood it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man all that God has prepared for those who love him. Verse 10, for to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. <clears throat> for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Verse 14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritually appraises, spiritual, sorry, appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ." I want you to read all that stuff. So I want you to understand this isn't just a cute little saying, I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. What that passage of Scripture is saying, 
Who can know the thoughts of a person? No one. The only way you can know the thoughts of a person is the, the spirit of the person knows the thoughts of the person. Right? And so the spirit of God knows the thoughts of God. So the scripture that says, eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor has entered in the heart of man, what God has prepared for those who love him, we quote that, and we need to keep going. Because it goes on to say, but you have been given the spirit of God. So you can know the thoughts of God. So profound. I can know the thoughts of God. I don't want to know some of your thoughts. I want you to know my thoughts. But God wants me to tap into his thoughts. Think like Jesus, pray like Jesus. I no longer have to wrestle with God. What's your will on the earth? Is this storm from you? Is this hurricane coming from you? Did you send COVID? Listen to my heart. Those are dumb prayers. You got bad theology. You don't know the heart of God. That's what that tells me. You're not someone who's, who's coming to this place of worship where you go, you're good. Your word says you're good, but out of encounters with you, I know you're good. You're a good, good father. There's no way that sin, sickness, disease, and poverty can come from you. I know the will of God for your life. It's to bless you. It's to prosper you. It's to fill you with his Holy Spirit. It's to lead you. you say, How can you be so confident? I know the will of God. Why? Because I know the thoughts of God. Why? Because I spend a lot of time with the Holy Spirit. You, how does this shift our prayer time? God, stop. That's not third heaven prayer. <clears throat> I'm seated with him, and I go, Jesus, I do want to pray to him. I don't want to just use cute one-liners. But how about instead of praying to him, you're praying with him? Jesus, what's on your heart right now? Prayer's a dialogue, and then I wait. And then I have a picture or, or sense in my heart about someone. And I'll say, Jesus, what are you praying for that person? Did you hear what I said? What are you praying for that person? Then what begins to happen, and I shared this last week, is that prayer, prayer, which is a dialogue, becomes prophecy. Because I look at somebody that's struggling with something in their life, and then all of a sudden, as I'm talking to Jesus, he shows me them free, whole, transformed, or the barren woman with a child, or the, you know, the addict made whole, or the person that doesn't have a spouse with a spouse. And, and we see these things, and God, it's God's thoughts for you. Don't always tell people those things, because <laughs> it's none of your business if they have a, you know, it's to be held for prayer. So in... The spirit, I go, Lord, I just see that person. I know they say, the doctor said they're barren. But Lord, you showed me them with a child. So I prophesy right now in the heavenly realm with you. I prophesy over them, not to them. I'm not going, hey, you know what? You're going to, I hold those things. Friends keep secrets. We have to learn that in maturity. The, the challenge with prophets and prophetic types, which we, this is our, what we cultivate in this church, is that we think that everything that God is speaking is for somebody else to do. That was my biggest weakness as a young prophetic person. God's telling the church to do this. It is humiliating to me to go back and look at my words when I was in my 20s. They're posted all online. And I realized I was going through that, that season. And I'm like, I could tell you what I was going through based on the words that are published. It's like embarrassing. So I've gotten older, and so when I hear something, I process it internally first before I release it. So prayer becomes prophecy. Now, once he reveals to me that person being healed of barrenness, now when I pray over them, I decree. You will have a child in Jesus' name. This is just work I'm doing in the spirit realm. This is not how I pray for them at this time. I'm doing work in the spirit. Did that make sense? It'll shift everything. Instead of prayer being this petition and supplication and you feel like you have to like wrestle with God over this issue and I'm not sure if it's your will that I'm healed and I'm not sure, Lord, you, you know, because this Calvinist teacher says some are doomed to be, go to hell and some are doomed to be saved and I don't know, is he one of your elect? It's like so confusing. God loved the whole world. He gave his son Jesus. 
Okay, so you can know the will of God. You can pray the will of God. You can know the mind of the Lord. That, that I don't know, man. That, this rocks me. I was just chewing on this this week. If you would have saw my notes before I erased them, you would have thought, we're going to be here a long time. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8, and I'm... Philippians chapter 2. Oh, no, I'm the re- NASB. Again, the whole book is good. <clears throat> verse 5. Uh, let's start in verse 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this is also the reason God exalted him high and bestowed on the name which every name and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. So how many of you know that it's impossible to be of the same mind Maintain the same love, be united in the spirit, intent on one person, on purpose, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, Uh, have humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself, impossible. I call impossible. You see, Ivan, the Bible's so hard. It's so hard, like Old Covenant says, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And it's just so hard. And I go, time out. Jesus made it even harder. He said, a new commandment I give you. Love your neighbor as I have loved you. So that other one, he made it diff- more difficult. You see, it's impossible. You're right. It is impossible for me, with all the pride that I have, to esteem you better than me. To think about you more than I think about myself. Impossible. Impossible. But he says, have this attitude in you. Have this mindset in you. How? I need the Holy Spirit. I cannot do this out of religion. I can't do this out of the flesh. I need to yield to the Holy Spirit. I need to ask the Holy Spirit to give me his thoughts towards you. I need to ask him to renew my mind continually so that when I start making it all about me all the time, You know, I want to be careful because some of you are qualified to talk about this. I'm not. But I just watch these trends that are happening right now where we are self-diagnosing. And we're diagnosing others. And if you listen to the young generation, like, you're gaslighting me, Dad. I don't know what that means. (laughs) Or that person's such a narcissist. Or or they're this. And, And like, my TikTok, yeah, I admit I have TikTok. My TikTok stuff is like all about neurodivergence and... I'm like, <laughs> like, like I have ADD. I'm convinced I have ADD. I have so many things based off of TikTok. I'm like, I think I have that too, man. <laughs> Got that, struggle with that, yep. It's like, it's like, stop self-diagnosing. You're not qualified to do that. What you are is someone who needs Jesus. So how do I love my neighbor as Christ loves them? I need Romans chapter 5. It's the love of God that is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. So what does this mean? I'm going to teach you a word here. So then to think like Jesus, let's just back up, means that you have humility, means that you are selfless. What? It means that you are a servant leader. Go back, read the verse. Those are the three things that it's talking about. His humility, putting others first. His selflessness, you know what I'm saying. Emptied himself. 
and he washed the feet. He laid his life down. Servant leader? Oh, that one I could spend a whole year on. The church, not you, but corporately, we have to be so careful, especially within our charismatic Pentecostal churches where we believe in the gifts of the Spirit are in operation for today. Because we think the most gifted person should get the most recognition. So basically, you all should serve me because I have gifts. That's not what the scripture says. The Bible says that he has given gifts to serve one another. So if you have a gift of prophecy, then how come you're not prophesying over people? Well, Ivan, when you give me the title, prophet, then I will prophesy. You're backwards. Never promote anyone that's not actually doing what they're created to do. I'm a pastor. Really? I have never seen you meet with anyone, never seen you counsel, shepherd, minister to anyone. But if you give me the title, it'll give me authority backwards. If you're led by the Spirit, you are drawn to do the very things that God's created you to do, and then people will recognize that anointing on you, and they'll come alongside of you. Titles and positions mean nothing. Function is what's critical. How do we do it? Serve the body. It requires being like Jesus. What happens if the church all of a sudden becomes a 10,000 member church and I become a celebrity? I'm going to need some of you to smack me upside the head. That's what happens. All of a sudden now, you get a huge platform. People are coming to you. You gave a word. and you. When I travel, I'm treated very differently than when I'm home, obviously. And I'm like, I could not live in the traveling world. Because people think, oh my goodness. It's like, it's like worship teams that travel. They're treated like celebrities. Some of these, they have alcohol in the green rooms. So when they're done leading worship, they go back, have a little wine. So it's like, who do you think you are? You're a servant of the body of Christ. Doesn't mean you don't have boundaries. Doesn't mean you don't. But you're called to serve people. How do we do it? You need to have a different way of thinking. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Well, Ivan, you know, I, I don't want to talk about church stuff all the time, but it's what I do all the time. It's like, I'd love to serve you. How much does it pay? <clears throat> you know how much money? I don't want to talk about it. We, we paid for the Costco stuff. for We paid for the, for the toilet paper for years. The church didn't do it. We did it. In our own pockets. It's a church. <laughs> anyway, you get, we, we have to understand this. We're doing this because we love Jesus and one another, not for some platform. If your guitar string breaks, pay for your dang guitar string, worship team. <laughs> oh, I played it on the stage. I just, I'm like, okay, we'll pay it for you because you don't understand the heart of a servant. You don't get it. We lay down our life for one another. But I'm so busy, you know, I'm so busy doing my nails. and Anyway. This is the one that we struggle with the most as a church. Not this church, church in general. Why? Because we got all these issues. Because I was taught in this church that it was joy was spelled Jesus, others, and you. And then I never took care of myself. And then I just served and I stacked the chairs and they never saw me and I was never promoted. And I'm like, victim. When you're ready to move on, it sounds to me like you don't have a no. So if you have boundaries, you can say no. But you serving should have been, like the Bible says, to the Lord. And when you're no longer serving the Lord, you start getting cranky. Raise your hands if you're cranky. No, I'm kidding. Don't do <laughs> I've been cranky. Right? And then all of a sudden, I start telling my wife, she's like, why did we do this in the first place? Who do you work for? Who are we serving? Jesus, I honor you. This is all about you, right? Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Don't make church and ministry and relationship this selfish thing. We're called to be cruciform life. Lay down your life for others. But it's impossible, friends, without the Holy Spirit. So let's look at two more passages of Scripture. What does it require? You're going to love this. Repent! We have to repent. 
I have to repent. Repentance is not a one-time thing. Well, I repented in 1978 and gave my life to Jesus. That's not what it means. So depending on your upbringing in church, repent's a bad word. Or it's a beautiful word. Does repentance mean run to the altar, cry, snow? Or, or this happens to me all the time. People will come to, up to me, find out I'm a pastor, and just start telling me disgusting things. I don't want to know your sin. I'm not, we're not Catholic. <laughs> don't tell me that. This is, I'm like, time out. Wrong religion. Like, you say, well, confess your faults to one another. Too much. Too much. TMI here. Happens to me all the time. I'm in the sauna. I'm in the airplane. Like, <laughs> and you're like, I just, like, wrong religion. <laughs> That's what they're thinking. And they, they feel better. I feel, I got to go home thinking, what they did? What? Why? Like, who does that? Like, disgusting. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make you laugh, but anyway. The word is similar. Metanoia. Change the way you think. Again, this principle is all throughout Scripture. Biblical repentance looks like this. And I, I don't know if I'm going to do a good job with this. I'm going to try. Okay, Holy Spirit, would you help me? I want to be sensitive. <laughs> you say, when do you ever care about people's feelings? I'm not sure. Just now, I just felt that. <laughs> There's this, it's a, it's a real study. It's a legit study. It's going to sound like I'm trying to be funny, but it's a legit study. And, and it's in the whole therapy world and counseling world that going and just talking about your problems all the time actually magnifies your problems. Did you hear what I said? So a lot of times when I'm up here, maybe I'm sounding like I'm self-justifying, but it's like, you just sound like you don't want to pastor people. Not like that. Because I read and study too much. It doesn't work. You can talk to me right now. I'm going to listen to you. Share your problems with me. The second time that we're going to meet, we're going to create a plan of action so that you can repent, turn in a different direction. Just coming and talking about your problems over and over again will never bring transformation. So they're studying even depression. And it is this thing of like, I'm just so sad and I'm just so sad and I'm just so discouraged and nobody likes me. Change the way you think and you won't be depressed anymore. Maybe Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said, be, be thankful, rejoice always. Did you know gratitude is the key to overcome mental health? Right. Study it. Jesus taught it from the very beginning in the Word, but now mental health research is so realizing that gratitude helps shift neural pathways. It takes your focus off of things. Did you know that if you're really sad, you're probably in your house with the lights dim <laughs> in bed, you know, or whatever. You know what they'll tell you to do? Remember what our parents used to tell us to do back when it was safe? Get out of the house. Well, do what? I don't know. Just don't be home the next hour. I get on my bike, and then you're not sad anymore. So culturally, we have to make another shift because we have a generation that's been taught just feelings, right? I care how you're doing. I do. I care. I, I care. But I don't always want to leave with like, how you doing? <sighs> That's not going to help you. What are you grateful for? What things are you celebrating? What things are you championing? All right? You get it. So change the way you think isn't just the Holy Spirit coming on you, fall on the floor, shake, and get up and go, <gasps> I'm completely think like Jesus. It is continuing in repentance. We have to work on this. It'll change all the spiritual warfare, how you prophesy, how you pray, how you give, how you live, is metanoia. Change the way you think. How in the world do we do that? Help us, Jesus. In John chapter 16, verse 14, I'm going to read it and then I'll, we'll pray. I got a little intense there, sorry, about the servant leader stuff. It triggered 23 years of pastoring. I don't want to serve because you'll take advantage of me. I just ask you to move one chair. Not 20 years of chair moving. I didn't know you 20 years ago when you were taken advantage of. It's like, calm down, Cletus. <laughs> All right.
right, I'm done here. I haven't stopped. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. That's how I feel. That's, thanks, Lord. <laughs> but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. I, I love that. Whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, Jesus says, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he takes of mine and discloses it to you. The Holy Spirit is the connector to heavenly glory. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It's not just power. It's not just uh, wind or fire. It's the third person of the Godhead. And so how is it possible that we're on earth right now, but we're seated in heavenly places? Holy Spirit. How is it possible that I can know the mind of the Lord? Holy Spirit. How is it possible that I even have a desire to repent? Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you a word, and then I'm going to be done. Then Erica can come up, because she's probably going, stop, you're over. Baby, I'm doing better than you should have saw the whiteboard before. It was a college course on prayer. I had A, B, C. That's the wrong word, actually. They say, they say when you're teaching that you should only teach 20, 30 minutes because that's people's attention span. And I'm like, I just refuse to believe that. <laughs> 40 minutes now? Oh, good. Oh, I want you. I want, so I'm probably close. Okay, I want you to learn this word before we're done. E-N-D-Y-O, I think it might be another O. Endio. Say endio. This word is beautiful. Do you know in the Colossians where it says, put on the new man? Put on the new man, or put off the deeds of the flesh. So it gives this picture of putting on like clothing. So if I walk into a room, and there's dirty clothes on the side, I can choose where I want to focus my thoughts, put on sinful nature, blah, 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 or put that off and put on the new man. That picture, to me, it was not helpful. It just felt hard for me personally. So I looked up the Greek word. Do you know what endio means? It actually means sink into or lean into. How profound is that? Stop. Here's Ivan. Sink. About to say something dumb. Here's what I go in my spirit. I am Christ in me, the hope of glory. I sink in into the manifest presence of the Lord. I make myself aware of his presence. I make, I make myself conscious through gratitude. I make myself aware. I'm about to make a decision. I, I'm being tempted by something. What do you do? Put on the old new man. Stop. Just learn to be in the presence of the Lord. Psalms 46.10, the Amplified Classic. Cease from your striving. Be still and know I'm God. Isn't that beautiful? I don't know why that impacts me so deeply. Some of you look like it's not doing anything to you. <laughs> I want you to learn the importance of worship and the Holy Spirit in your relationship with God. I want you this week to start making yourself, how do you pray without ceasing? It's a heart posture. You're continually aware that God is with you, he's in you, he's around you. Now start doing that when you're having conversations with people, when you feel triggered, when you're talking to your kid who you want to give a cocotazo to, or uh, cocotazo is this. Just pause, time out, and just lean in. Whoo, there you are, Jesus. <sighs> Who can know the thoughts of man but the spirit of man? What are your thoughts in this situation? You know what they'll start to say of you? You're the wisest person I've ever spoke to. How did you get so wise? I just was quiet. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit just gave me a thought. And I just shared what he said, and now everybody thinks I'm smart. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Would you stand with me? I, I know I gave you a lot, but I had way more. <laughs> I had the whole front back. And the... Let's just, 
Open your heart for a moment. This is almost like another message I'm starting, but I don't mean to. But it is this thing of be thankful. Gratitude is the cure for most mental health issues. And it's also this thing, thank you, Tamara, of rejoice always is the cure for most emotional problems. Think about it. How joyful you are is your choice. So I get to choose joy. Pray without ceasing. That's the cure to this entire transformation that we need, spirit, soul, body. It's learning to abide in Jesus. So just close your eyes for a moment. Don't worry, we have security, so you don't have to worry. Some of you guys are scared. If you close your eyes, somebody's going to steal your purse. Just, just rest for a moment. Feel your feet standing on the ground. Pay attention. It's a little hot in here today for me. I'm sweaty. I'm going to pay attention to me. Pay attention to my breathing. I'm going to start just taking a deep breath, calming myself down a little bit, finding the sense of peace. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, I know you're with us. I know you're in us. Will you just make us aware of you? Lord, you made Christianity not difficult, impossible. Without the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we need you. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, to reveal the thoughts of Jesus to us. Jesus, what do you think of me? What do you think of my present circumstances? I want you just to wait. Allow thoughts, impressions, visions, just to fill your heart. Just take 30 seconds. Holy Spirit, manifest your presence. Thank you for healing Iris, Lord. Thank you for healing Tanya, Lord. Lord, thank you for transforming people's lives, Lord. The blood still speaks. The blood still speaks. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. I want you to practice leaning in right now. It's what Erica was doing in the beginning of the service. We lean into your presence. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Empowered Living Podcast by Empowered Life Church. We hope it blessed you. Subscribe so you can stay up to date with our latest podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about us, check us out at facebook.com slash ELC talent or check out our website www.empoweredlifechurch.org. Have a blessed week.